But it's my pleasure to invite our next speaker, who is um, Professor Jenny Mundell in our Department of Epidemiology and Public Health here at UCL. And Jenny teaches um, 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 bits on the course um, in population health. Um, and Jenny's going to talk broadly about the health survey for England, is that fair to say? Yes. Um, but Jenny, over to you. Okay. So uh, I work mostly on the health survey for England. I also work on transport and health. And I've done one study that managed to take the two. And if we have time to end up, I'll show you a bit of that. So what I'm going to talk about is um, what the health survey for England is. And I'll answer a few questions. Is obesity really as big a problem as people say? What's he's been drinking and, and who does it? Did the smoke free law make any difference? Are we a nation of couch potatoes? And talk and my title is on sex, drugs and rock and roll. So the Health Survey for England is a series of annual health surveys that have been run every year since 1991, but it's a new sample each year. So it's not the same people, although we do try to follow them up uh, by linking their responses to uh, national data when we can. It used to be commissioned by the Department of Health initially, but uh, most of the time by what was the Health and Social Care Information Centre, which changed its name last year to NHS Digital for reasons best known to them. We want to change it all out. Let's head in, but there we go. And it's conducted by the Joint Health Surveys Unit of NatSEM Social Research and UCL. And by UCL, it actually means my team in the Health and Social Surveys Research Group. And if you come here, you will meet us. It surrounds a sample of the general population. So unlike most surveys, we can actually not only look at what's going on, but we can actually say in the general population in England, this number of people have this problem or behave in this way. And um, that's very important. One of the things that we can do is look at undiagnosed disease as well as diagnosed disease. So if you use GP records or hospital records or disease registers, you can look at how people with diabetes are being treated and how many of them are being adequately controlled. But you don't know anything about people who haven't got a diagnosis. But with the Health Survey for England, we can also measure people's blood pressure. We can measure people, the sugar in people's blood, and we can know what proportion of the, of the population have diabetes that isn't diagnosed, and who those people are. So if you wanted to target them for, for screening, you'd know whether you're looking at older people or younger people, or in different parts of the country, or different age group, um, different income groups, for example. So we don't have a population register in this country, because in, in most of Europe, they do but if they do do a survey like this, they actually have a list of people and they can sample that list. We can't. So we take a random sample of addresses, of private addresses, and then send them a letter, explain a bit about the survey, and then the interviewer goes along, tells them a bit more, tries to uh, get them to agree to take part, interviews them, measures height and weight if they agree, also some self-completion questions. Then if they agree, a trained nurse goes and measures their waist and hip circumference, uh, measures their blood pressure, takes saliva from children and some years from adults to measure cotinine, which I'll, I'll come back to later, and takes some blood samples from adults. And occasionally does like things in 2010, uh, we measured lung function in, in children and adults as well. And the data are then archived in the UK Data Service, and this is something that is used a lot on, in the Population Health BSC, and is something that uh, you get familiar with, with using. Uh, it's actually the second most used government data set in the entire enormous UK data service. And it's used by policymakers and by practitioners and by researchers, but it's also used by undergraduate and postgraduate taught students and by research students. So, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. In 2010, for the first ever time, I think the only time so far, uh, Health Survey for England included questions on sexual health, on contraception, on infections, and a few, a few findings that uh, just over two thirds of men and nearly three quarters of women aged 16 to 24 reported that they had ever had 
sex and intercourse with someone of the opposite sex. Or you could say one third of men and a quarter of women aged 16 to 24 didn't report having uh, had sex with somebody of the opposite sex. Um, obviously, depending on what you're interested in, which of those two identical results uh, you would be, be more interested in. Uh, just under 2% of men and women aged 16 to 69 said that they had had sex with somebody of the same sex in the last five years. Almost 9 out of 10 of women aged 16 to 24 who are currently having sexual relations said that they were using at least one form of contraception. And just over a quarter of men and a bit under half of women aged 16 to 24 said that they had been tested with chlamydia, which is an infection which can cause some acute problems, but it can also cause uh, some more serious chronic problems for women, including infertility. Now, most of our analyses of HSC data are conducted by sex. You, you look at the results in men separately from the results in women. Really, we should be using the term gender, but uh, we have to do what our bosses tell us. So, childhood obesity. BMI's body mass index, it's weight in kilograms divided by height squared in meters squared. And in 2015, which is the most recent data we have, because at the moment the 2017 surgery survey is in the field, we're collecting data. We're planning the 2018 one and doing the research ethics applications. We've just received the data for 2016 and uh, beginning to write the report. So the most recent data that's actually available are from 2015. So 15% of boys were overweight and another 15% were obese. Slightly fewer, 13% of girls were overweight and 13% were over, uh, so 13% each overweight and obese. And that comes to just over one and a half million children under 11 and one million adolescents aged 11 to 15 who are overweight or so what is normal? And there is a bit of a problem with the use of the word normal, because normal actually means statistically average. But most people use normal to mean healthy. Now, if, most, if you're looking at something where most people are healthy, then you can use the word normal. But if you're looking at something where most people actually aren't healthy, then you don't want to be normal, you want to be healthy. So a healthy BMI, for adults, is between 18 and a half and just and under 25 kilograms per meter squared. Waist circumference for men healthy is less than 94, and for women healthy is less than 80 centimeters. Now, the average man in England in 2015 was 175.5 centimeters, weighed 85 kilos, which is a slight problem. I was in a lift yesterday, uh, which said maximum 10 people or 800 kilograms. And I was thinking, I hope they have thin people working here, or that they would use the stairs, but the problem is that it's the thin people who tend to use the stairs. Um, body mass index is 27.6, and weight circumference 97. So BMI shows that he's overweight, and the waist circumference is high. The average woman in England, height 162 centimetres, weight 71.3 kilos, BMI 27.1, waist circumference 88.4, so again, overweight and actually has a very high waist circumference, not just high. And these affect people's health. So why is obesity important? Well, in England, obesity causes around 9,000 premature deaths every year. Each of those people loses an average of nine years of life, and it costs the country more than three and a third billion pounds not only in healthcare costs, in income tax that people aren't paying because they're dead or because they're not working, in social support, in, in loss of uh, productivity to the economy. So a wide range of healthcare costs, social costs, and societal costs. But is obesity really going up, as much as people say? And is it worse than males or females? So look at children first. Hands up if you think it's worse in boys. Hands up if you think it's worse in girls. Oops, that wasn't what I 
one to do. Is that the middle? The middle one. The middle one. There we are. So these two lines are obesity, <coughs> and this is overweight or obese. Um, blue for boys and red for girls, and it's it's pretty much the same. Given the small that the that there are about a thousand boys and a thousand girls in most years, occasionally uh, in recent years, and random variation. You know, we need to watch that. This is a three-year rolling average to smooth out some of those random ups and downs. So we need to watch this because if that's beginning to go up again, that's worrying. But it could just be a little blip. So not much difference uh, between boys and girls, age 2 to 15. Um, obesity. More in men, more in women. And overweight. More in men or women. Right, so, obesity was more in women than men, and in the 1990s until the early 2000s, it was increasing quite steeply. Since then, it's carried on going up, but very, very slowly, and it's more or less the same. Now, overweight, on the other hand, and this is overweight or obese, so the gap between these is overweight, much, much higher in men than in women. Again, but it is falling in men and falling more slowly in women. So there's some good news and some bad news. So we found that over a third of men had a very high waist circumference, and almost half of women had a very high waist circumference. And as I mentioned, that average woman in 2015 had a, a waist circumference above the... Um, above the threshold. And there are also social inequalities in obesity, and that will mean there are also social inequalities in diabetes and in high blood pressure and in cardiovascular disease and in cancers that are affected by obesity. So dark blue is obese, measured as BMI, or what you might call general obesity, and the pale blue is very high waist circumference, so that's abdominal or central obesity. And that has a much bigger, having, having fact here rather than there, has a much bigger impact on uh, your risk of various diseases. So here you can see that there's a bit of a social gradient in men and quite a marked social gradient in women. And we quite often find that it's not a smooth gradient, and it may be that the women in the lowest income group are more physically active and have less money and are less likely uh, to have enough money food or maybe smoking a lot more uh, that might explain that, that difference. So drugs. Three types of drugs. There's prescribed drugs which I will be referring to as medicines. There's illegal drugs and there's legal drugs. But we don't include any questions in the Health Service for England about illegal drugs. The second, the smoking drinking and drugs use in secondary school children survey, which is also run by NATS and also for paper like NHS does, but in health survey for England we don't. So I can't talk about those. Uh, I'll just mention briefly uh, prescribed medicines. Uh, we collect this data every year when the nurse does her visit. She asks people what uh, drugs, if any, they've been prescribed and which of those they've actually taken in the last seven years. Seven days, sorry. Uh, the only time we've actually analysed it was for the 2013 report. Uh, we had huge media headlines. I was interviewed at well, virtually non stop from 9 a.m. till 5 p.m. on radio and television. Uh, massive coverage. I think people will be uh, mentioning this again. Um, most people were interested in the large proportion of women who are on antidepressants. So I'm going to talk a bit more about uh, legal drugs. Uh, this is in the days when tobacco advertising was uh, legal, and I thought this was rather um, an amusing ju juxtaposition of ads, uh, whether it was done intentionally or whether it was real serendipity, I don't know. So, who are the drinkers? So these are people drinking five, six, or seven days a week. And in blue are men, and in black is the women, an age group 
along the bottom. So you can see that, by and large, older people drink more than, more often than younger people. Uh, binge drinking uh, is often mentioned. Binge drinking is defined as drinking more than twice the recommended daily limit. Now, the recommended daily limit is a uh, maximum of three units for a woman and four units for a man, although they've been reducing the weekly amount, they haven't changed that. So, binge drinking, is, binge drinking is more than six units for a woman and more than eight units for a man on one day. Um, and one of the problems with, with drinking is that the size of the glass, for those who drink wine, the size of the glass has increased. It used to be that a standard glass was 125 mils. A standard glass is now 175 and called small, or 250, which is called large, which is double the size it used to be. And alcohol, the amount of alcohol in wine has increased. So it used to be that a standard bottle contained around six units which is 625 ml glasses, each of which had one unit. Now, an average bottle contains nine or 10 units, and the glass is 175 or 250 ml, which means that the average glass of wine, instead of being one unit, is two or three units. So a lot of people are drinking more alcohol than they realize. Um, that many people are well aware of it. So, Binge drinking, where it tends to be done much more by younger people, 16 to 24, 25 to 34. And in the younger adult group, it's about the same for men and women, but it is much more in men than women as you get older. And this is putting the two together. You can see that although older people drink more often, younger people drink more on a single occasion, and uh, the ones in the middle here tend to do both, which is probably not that good for them. So what do people drink? And I hear somewhere where men and women do tend to be different. Of people who were reported what they were drinking when they were been drinking, and these are data from 2008, over that nearly two-fifths of men were drinking beer, and two-fifths of women drinking wine if they were drinking only one uh, type of alcohol uh, and similar numbers were drinking two types. Looking at smoking, and again this is a three-year rolling average to um, get rid of those little uh, random changes from year to year. So, oops, no, that wasn't what I meant. Right. Uh, so in 2003, it's about just over a quarter of the men, about 23% of women, and it's now down to 17% of women and 19% of men. So it's falling, it's falling even faster in uh, children aged 11 to 15, which is very good news. Here, grey are people who've never smoked, and younger cohorts, uh, particularly in men, uh, are more and more likely left to start smoking. Older women were very likely not to, uh, not to have smoked because it, it wasn't the dumb thing for women when they were young. Uh, but that generation is mostly dying out. Uh, a lot of these people did smoke. Uh, this is current smoking. Uh, the, the, the proportion of the population that smokes falls off dramatically with age. Why? There are two reasons, and one of them is shown here. Yes? Yeah, so one reason that there are far fewer current smokers is because they quit, and so they are these paler bars here of ex-smokers. The other is that they die prematurely. One in two smokers will die uh, prematurely because of smoking, and therefore they're not here to take part in, in the survey. But again, there's a huge, huge inequalities by income. So this is taking people's household income and uh, dividing it, uh, adding, adjusting for the number of adults and the number of children. So we get what's called equivalised household income. And then we divide it into five equal groups called quintiles. So in the highest two quintiles of income, 
um, about 12% of men smoke. And here you can see 29% of men in the fourth and 33% of men in the lowest income group smoke. And a similar uh, graded to fewer in smoking. Yes. Um, but again, a marked, marked inequality. I thought you might be interested in e-cigarettes, since those are new things. So this is the proportion of people of different ages who are currently using an e-cigarette. And um, if you, I go back, you'll talk about here, the, X, the Y axis goes up to 40%. Here, uh, the highest group is just under 6%. And uh, the study we did showed you know, most of these people, some of them are current smokers, uh, and uh, many are ex-smokers, and uh, they're using e-cigarettes instead. And very, very few people who haven't smoked. So did the smoke-free law make a difference? In, uh, well, it's, it was 10 years ago, uh, 1st of July, the uh, smoke-free legislation that bans smoking in public places or in places in enclosed places that the public go to and in workplaces came into effect and there had been two years worth of uh, publicity for that initially to persuade the decision makers the politicians to introduce the law and then to explain to the general population uh, why it had been introduced to the policy that was part of the initial uh, publicity as well so uh, each of these slides I'm going to show you has got dark blue for the first six months of 2017 and pale blue for the second six months after the law came into effect. And this is the geometric mean cotinine because cotinine, which is um, it's from nicotine, the way the body handles nicotine is to convert it to cotinine, so it's a metabolite and it indicates exposure to tobacco uh, or nicotine. And if you actually smoke yourself or chew tobacco, then the levels will be 100, 200, 300 uh, nanograms per mil. But if you're exposed to other people's smoke, then your level will be uh, nowadays under, usually under 12 nanograms, so it's a huge difference. And people who aren't exposed at all, the level will be undetectable, which is less than one. 0.1 nanograms per mil. So it's very skewed, and that's why we use the geometric mean. So here you can see that both in men and women, it fell dramatically uh, after the implementation of the law. These are the 95% confidence intervals. Similar falls by age, 16 to 34, 35 to 55, 55 plus. We have to use bigger, uh, uh, wider age groups so that there are more people because we're dividing the sample into two six-month batches. Uh, similarly, if you look at people's occupational social class, professional managerial, uh, that includes university lecturers, intermediate and routine. It also uh, falls, uh, these are all these studies from people with, who are non-smokers. They said they weren't smokers and they had a level less than 12 or whatever cutoff we were using at that time. So these people, it fell in people who said that they were exposed to tobacco smoke, but it also fell in people who said they weren't exposed to tobacco smoke. It fell in people in whom smoking was allowed in the home on most days. It also fell in people who said no, they didn't allow any smoking in the home most days. Now this is for children aged 4 to 15, from under 8, we assume they're not smokers, 8 to 15 year olds are given a self-completion. Parents can look at the paper questionnaire before it's given to the child, so they can see what questions are being asked. The child answers it by themselves and then puts it into an envelope, seals it, and hands it to the interviewer. Um, so the children who said, age 8 to 15, who said they didn't smoke, and whose coating again, indicated ex passive smoking exposure uh, or none, not individual active use. So 1998 it was up here, by 2000 to 2003 it was pretty static here and 
then in the first half of 2005. Now, it was around here that we started doing a lot of media advocacy about the harmful effects of passive smoking on children and on adult non-smokers and the need to protect people uh, and the need for smoke-free legislation. And what happened was legislation actually came in here came in here, but um, the fall in children happened beforehand. Now some people looked at this and said, oh well, we did, obviously the law made an effect, but that's not the accurate interpretation. What happened is there was so much publicity that people started voluntarily protecting their children that uh, the proportion of households which didn't allow anybody to smoke in the house increased dramatically over this period, including more slowly but very definitely in households where one or both parents smoked, also were more like, became more likely to not smoke in the house and not let other people smoke in the house. So it did have an effect. And in fact, most of the places that the law affected are not places that children go to, they're pubs, restaurants, and workplaces. So children were, were protected by the public health advocacy around the law rather than so much by the law itself. And also some uh, adults responded to the fact that the law was coming in by stopping smoking, although not very many of that wasn't its main intention. And then subsequently we can see it's actually um, fallen even more. And again in this time we've, we've also seen that the proportion of uh, so yeah, so the, the law and the advocacy. Uh, so undetectable salivary cotinine, so these are children who to all intents and purposes have no exposure. And again you can see that in 1983 to 2003, it was about 14%. And then this big rise during that period stayed pretty much the same, 2007, 2008, and then 2013 and 2015, it's, it's above 60% now. And undetectable cotinine by household income. So again, there are social inequalities. You can see this time the slope's going that way. Uh, and people smoking regularly in the home. So two thirds of children where nobody smokes in the home don't have detectable cotinine. But if one or more people smoke at home, uh, or it's people who live in the home who smoke rather than people necessarily smoking in the home, uh, very, very few. And again, if, now I beg your pardon, that's the parental smoking. No parent smoking, one parent smokes, both parents smoke. Very few of those have undetectable coating, most of them are exposed. And this is about smoking in the home, so none, uh, one or more. But the good news is that, so although these inequalities persist and uh, they, they are in some ways more marked, actually the number of people in this group is getting smaller and smaller and smaller because even when parents smoke, most of these people are now in this category of saying, no, there's no smoking in the home. So although the inequalities in absolute terms are very great, the, the, the number of children affected is getting smaller and smaller. So are we a nation of couch potatoes? In some years, we don't lecture this every year because it's a very long module, but in some years we ask about physical activity. Uh, we did in 2016 in adults, and that will be, uh, we've just got the data starting to, to look at that. That will be in the report which will be published in December, and in the report published in 2016, we have physical activity in children. Uh, so the, these data are going to be from 2008 and 2012. So here, uh, people have done any aerobics, keep fit, gymnastics, or dance fit, dance fitness in the last four weeks by age and sex. Um, quite a lot of women, not so many men. And any other dancing? Again, quite a lot of women, not so many men, except in the oldest group. Now, when we look at it by the summary activity level, so MET recommendations is at least 150 minutes a week of moderate or vigorous activity in bouts of at least 10 minutes. It no longer needs to be spread at least half an hour, at least five times a week. So it's actually much easier. 
to achieve, and you can achieve it by walking and cycling to work, to school, to university, to the station, whatever. Um, some activity is people who didn't do that much but did um, some, and low activity basically did, I think it was less than 30 minutes a week compared with the 150. So this is looking at people who did any of these dance related things uh, by whether or not they met the recommendations or calculators or something. You can see that um, over 70% of, of the men who met the recommendations did actually do some of those things um, and half of the women. And when we looked at other dancing, again, quite a lot of uh, the men. And I think the reason for this is that um, the two data sets found slightly different in 2008 and 2012. So this is 2008, the previous source I showed you 2012 and 2008, I think by chance, or maybe there was something going on that year, um, and maybe the next slide I'll show, picture I'll show you towards the end explains it, there were a lot of more men who were dancing, so that's I think why we've got slightly discrepant. And one of the things about the survey is looking at these discrepant results and saying, is there some, is there a story behind it, or is it just a random, a random chance, uh, a random change? Um, so looking at reporting other dancing in 2000, so this is not sort of gym-based activities uh, in 2008 and 2012. So purple, uh, nice with some colours here. Uh, purple for 2008 and green for 2012, and you can see that people aged 16 to 24 in 2008, I don't know why, and I suspect that it's just uh, a chance finding that if we did show the confidence intervals, they would be wide, there are probably relatively fewer people in that age group. Um, so not much change there. Um, but that, that first slide was, taking part in, you know, doing it at least once in the last four weeks. This is the amount of time people spent. And here you can find that the older people spent, the older people who were sampled and took part in 2008 spent much more time um, dancing in 2008 than the equivalent people did in 2005. Uh, 2012, sorry. So, to sum up, There are differences by sex or perhaps by gender in most things that we look at in the HSE. Um, like I mentioned, 19% of men and 17% of women are current smokers. There's a difference in what men and women drink, how much they drink, and when they drink. More men are overweight, but more women have abdominal obesity. Overall prevalence of smoking is falling. If you look at the trends, we now have more than 25 years of trends. The exposure to tobacco smoke is smalling, but some children are still exposed, although it's improving. There are still worrying amounts of binge drinking, although it has been falling in recent years, particularly in young adults. Uh, binge drinking isn't as common as it was previously. Anybody recognise that? Or can make a guess what that is? Any bit of chemistry? Ethanol. And um, looking at prescribed medicines, what we've shown elsewhere, we've had a quite paper in the last, is that although the prevalence, uh, the frequency of uh, how common high blood pressure hypertension is, hasn't changed over the last. Uh, 10 years, the proportion of people who are diagnosed has risen, the proportion of those who've been treated has risen, and the proportion of those treated people who actually have their blood pressure well controlled has risen. So we're doing much better at finding people with something that can be treated and can be uh, you can reduce their risk of developing stroke and heart disease. Um, but the overall level hasn't fallen. And to do for the overall level to fall, you need a population shift in the amount of physical activity people do. That needs to increase the amount of salt in the diet, 
needs full amount of alcohol to be used at all. So, rock and roll, physical activity. Uh, dancing's good for you. It's not only physical activity, it's good for you because it's physical activity, it's good because it makes you feel good, it releases endorphins, and I thoroughly recommend it. Uh, people who dance, as I showed with some of those charts, are generally more active than other people. Now, of course, there's some people who can't be active and can't dance because they have physical impairments, but even if you allow for that, uh, it's still uh, people who dance are generally more active. It helps meet the recommendations for physical activity, and people of any age can dance. And uh, Dr. Shelton and uh, Connie wrote a paper about dancing um, in men of the John Sargent age. So I'd like to thank everybody who makes the health survey, so health survey possible, and if I've got so just a couple of examples of how um, HSE data has been used. So uh, you may have heard about the tax on fizzy drinks, tax on sugar sweetened beverages. Uh, so they used height and weight measurements from Health Survey for England to model statistically uh, what an impact would have. And they found that a 20% tax on sugary drinks might reduce consumption by 15%. Obviously, that, that didn't come from HSE, that came from other studies. But looking at a reduction in consumption by 15%, what impact that might have on people's weight and how it might reduce obesity. So it might lead to 180,000 fewer obese people. And obesity costs the NHS five billion pounds a year. I mentioned at the beginning that I look at transport and I look at HSE. I've done one study that's involved both, and this was it. In 2005, we had an extra large sum for people aged 65 and over, and we tested their ability to do various things like get up out of the chair, uh, balance on one foot, uh, their grip strength. But one of the things we did was time the nurses timed them as they walked for eight feet, and from that we could uh, calculate their walking speed. And we found that. Amongst the general population living in their own homes, age 65 and over, who were able to walk 8 feet safely by themselves, <coughs> three quarters of men and 85% of women had a normal walking speed of less than 1.2 meters per second. And in fact, the, the average speed uh, was considerably lower than that. So this is what we found with age. And the reason for 1.2 meters per second is important because, you know, when the green man is lit up to cross the road, that's called the invitation to cross, and depending on the width of the road, that's six, eight, or ten seconds. And then that goes blank, but the traffic lights don't go green for the motor vehicles until there's been what's called a clearance period. And that clearance period assumes a walking speed of 1.2 meters per second, which is just over three miles an hour. So if your walking speed is 0.8 or 0.9 meters per second, you cannot get, and you start crossing just before the green man disappears, you cannot get across the road before the light is green for cars. Now, we don't actually find large numbers of hit elderly people at pedestrian crossings. People just choose not to go out because they know they can't get across. And even if they're going by bus, unless it's a circular trip, a circular route, you have to cross the road one way or the other to get to the bus stop. So it's a major problem. Um, we published a paper and uh, an NGO called Living Streets saw it, took it up and have been campaigning. We didn't manage to get the government to change the, um, the speed uh, that, they could, that they could do. They had loads and loads of media coverage, as you can imagine. And if you've got a spare five minutes, if you Google on YouTube, hey, Mr. Boris, there's a group of older people in Kilburn who uh, made a YouTube based on our results. Um, but uh, what the government has said is that in future, no pedestrian crossings, uh, signalised crossings should be put in of the old sort. So they're all now either the sort that's got the camera that detects there's still somebody on the crossing or it's a countdown ones are the only ones that are allowed to be put in because of our research. Thank you. Thank you.
anyone like to ask any questions about her presentation in relation to the health survey for the data she talked about? It's not the back. Um, just considering the impact of smoking. Yeah. Uh, the smoking uh, is there an impact other than on the smoking? Because it's the, has, led, has it led partly to the closure of the public? There were 7,000 pubs closed recently, and I just wonder if the smoking law also impacts something such as drinking. Uh, I'm not sure about drinking, but as regards pubs, if you go on the ASH, actual smoking health website, uh, I'm pretty sure that they've got some uh, some fact sheets there. But pubs were smoking at try again, shall I? Pubs were closing at a phenomenal rate before the law, uh, and the rate of closures didn't change. Uh, pubs are pubs are always closing, and other pubs are opening. And actually, it, it has nothing to do with the law. But of course, the the uh, relevant uh, indus industry organisations, particularly stoked by the, the tobacco industry, was sort of, uh, getting them to, to complain about it. Uh, but I mean, there, there may be some people who don't go to the pub because of not being able to smoke. But equally, there's a vastly bigger audience of people who are avoiding pubs because of the smoke. Now get people now go so. Um. But you're right. Well, I have to look at, at, at the broader uh, things because jobs and so on do affect people's health. And that's a very important at the population level. Uh, but also, of course, it it also protects the health. of people working in pubs tend to be amongst the lowest paid with the poorest health. So it's also important to protect their health. Any other questions? I can ask one question, Jen. So you show in relation to obesity and people overweight has been increased. There's increased markedly over the last what since HSE has been really collecting data. We were talking earlier on this morning about life expectancy and how many countries' life expectancies on the increase. Yeah. The UK is no exception to that. So what do you think is going on there in relation to the fact that you talked about how obesity is related to is it nine thousand premature deaths each year? Yeah. So, it has. There, there have been various people who've uh, published that it, it. This may be the first ever generation that dies younger than the parents, because it, over the last you know, two hundred years, every, every generation has had a longer life expectancy. Particularly, getting rid of uh, the causes of infant and child mortality, uh, which has the biggest impact on your life expectancy. Life expectancy has been increasing in high-income countries, mostly because of uh, marked falls in smoking. So that is still carrying on, um, but um, with the increase in obesity, there may come a time where, where life expectancy uh, falls, and it may be that the discrepancy between male and female life expectancy narrows as well. Thank you. Well, if you join me in thanking Jenny for her great presentation. Uh,